Hey guys, it's Leanna and I'm here today to talk about The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. I gave this book three stars. In retrospect, I don't know that it merits three stars. I don't know. I really did not like this book. I would go so far as to say that I kind of hated it. So three seems very high, especially if you go by the Goodreads metric of like three means I liked it. I don't think I can say that I liked it. It's just one and two stars seems more cruel. And I don't think that this book is the kind of bad where I, I, I can't, I don't even know if I can put it into words. It's not the kind of bad where I'm like, oh, you suck at writing and this is terrible and these sentences don't make sense. And there's like, you know what I mean? Like, it's not this sort of hateful, like, I think you suck. Uh, it's just more that I'm like really so utterly underwhelmed and disappointed. One, just generally by the book, but two, also knowing this author and having read other books by her. I don't love all of her books the way some people do, but I have previously read her books and thought that they were of good quality. I really love Vicious, although when I first read Vicious the very first time, I hated it, but that's more because I didn't know. I had a very different idea of what Vicious was going into it and I was you know, misinformed or I had the incorrect impression. So there's more expectation versus reality than the fault of the book. So I reread it years later, this time obviously knowing what I was getting myself into and I loved it. So I mean, I loved Vicious and I quite like the Shades of Magic series. I'm not obsessed with it. All Again, all this to say, like I've experienced liking this author's work and I have more to the point, not just liked her work, but especially in something like Vicious, I have seen her willingness um, and her ability to portray and delve into some messy, dark gray characters, which is why it's all the more shocking to me that this book completely fails on that level in particular. It fails on several levels, but that level is the one that is the most surprising to me because I know she's capable of doing this. I've seen it. So it's not so, if, I, if this was a debut, I'd be like, well, this author just, isn't able to do that, I know she's able to do it. I've seen it, so I just don't understand the, it. then I have to assume that it is a choice to not do that here because I've seen that she can, and that is baffling to me. <laughs> if you don't know what The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue is at all, then I think you've been under a rock. <laughs> but um, it is V.E. Schwab's newest book. V.E. Schwab herself has been hyping the fuck out of this book, talking about how this book is her legacy, this is her baby, she's been writing it for years. If she never wrote another book, like at least she wrote Addie, Addie is like, this is her book. And so I went into it already a little bit skeptical because I was like, I it can't possibly live up to the hype that the author herself has given it. So let's go in with a grain of salt, which is just as well because it needed all the salt that it could get. But basically the story of it is Addie LaRue has been cursed to be forgotten by everybody that she meets, but she's immortal. So it's a deal with the devil type situation. So like 300 years before our present day now, this is when the, she made this a deal. So much like Vicious, it plays with the timeline. It jumps back and forth. Vicious plays with the timeline a lot more. Like it jumps all over the place. She's kind of doing that here again, which is why like that is the, the comparison that again is the most shocking because like Vicious did it right. It played with the timeline and had messy characters. This is playing with the timeline and it should have had messy characters, but it didn't. So Addie makes this deal with the devil to, I mean, there's there's reasons for it, although I have to say her reasons for making this deal are kind of thin and not very compelling. And she didn't do a good enough job putting me in the headspace of this character to make it really believable to me that she'd be pushed to that kind of brink. Like I'm getting the kind of situation that's painted here. Like I get what she's getting at, the kind of trapped feeling that would make a person be willing to make this kind of deal, but I just didn't really buy it. <laughs> like I wasn't with Addie enough, or I wasn't deep enough in Addie's head, or I wasn't feeling Addie's feelings enough to really be like with her on this whole desperate times call for desperate measures thing. But I was like, all right, fine. I mean, I knew this was the premise. So here we go. Here's the inciting incident. She's making that deal. Um, and so we flip back and forth between catching up to the present where like Addie is getting to know her curse, getting to know how it works, trying to navigate how to live in a, in a world with this curse, how to make the best of life while cursed. And the present day where she meets a young man who she's like quite enamored of. And um, throughout history and in the present, she has routinely, typically on the anniversary of her curse, she meets up with the one who cursed her, who is this ambiguously dark character. He's referred to as the darkness. I mean, he's kind of this, the devil in the story. Although when they talk about whether or not he is the devil, like Lucifer or Beelzebub or whatever, uh, that is remains vague and unclear, but he is this dark force who has, who she sold her soul to in exchange for, for eternal life at the expense of no one remembering her. So I remember when I heard that premise, I thought to myself, uh, it's a decently cool premise, but that sounds to me like a short story. 
That sounds to me like something that could be a really compelling, interesting snippet. <laughs> It's something that I could easily see Neil Gaiman writing. And I know that V.E. Schwab and Neil Gaiman are friends. So part of me was like, is Neil influencing her? Except I wish Neil Gaiman had written this because then it would be good. <laughs> but V.E. Schwab herself has written short stories. That's what this felt like, that that premise. I was like, I, I'm really struggling to see how you could stretch that premise into a full novel. But all right, like I, I, I trust you. Like you're not my favorite author by any stretch, but you are a good author and you've told interesting stories like Vicious. So... Let's, let's see what you do with it. If you think there's a novel's worth of story here, let's let's see what that is. And there is not a novel's worth of story here. I still think that it's difficult to stretch this concept into a full novel, yet in the hands of an author like Neil Gaiman, it could be done. And I would have thought an author like B.E. Schwab could have the capacity to do it. And this, and she's been, by her own estimation and admission, she's been writing this thing for years. Like, I'm, I, I, might be wrong with this, but I recall her at one point saying she's been writing it for like 10 years. I might be mixed up about that length of time, but it's been years for sure. Years plural. I don't know what she's been doing for those years. <laughs> this book doesn't, it feels like it needs a lot more delving, a lot more work, and the, it, it was so surface level. I'm gonna put this down because it's kind of heavy. It was so, so, so surface level. I had a lot of problems with it as well in terms of a sort of logistical kind of problems with it, like with the mechanics of the curse, which I'll get into in a second, but that part of it I'd be willing to forgive more if I had found the characters really, really, really compelling, because then to me that Nate, that, that type of story, the curse itself is kind of irrelevant because the curse is really just the excuse to place our characters in this situation which tests their mettle, and that's what we're here for, is to really delve into these characters, and like the curse is like just like an inciting device to put them in that situation but it's kind of like okay like we curse them so curse irrelevant but like what we're here for is to analyze what that would do to your mind we didn't really do either so she spends kind of a lot of time going into sort of the details of how the curse works which is to its detriment because the w she goes into enough detail where you're like okay so you're wanting me to really buy this and to really delve into the details of how this curse is supposed to work and yet there are a lot of holes in this, which I'll get to in a second. But I couldn't ignore those because again, you spent a lot of time on them and two, you did not write compelling characters. You, it, it, it just was not believable that Addie LaRue was 300 years old. Because if you're alive for 300 years, that's already going to mess with you a little bit. If you're alive for 300 years and not able to cre have any human connection because everyone forgets you, that would fuck with your head hardcore. It would. Which is why having her, I've seen her write messed up characters in Vicious. So Eli and Victor are a little messed up in the head. Addie should be more messed up in the head. Addie is way too boringly normal for somebody who's been alive for as long as she has, has had zero consequences for her actions because no one remembers her, so she can do whatever fuck she wants within the limits of her curse. And who has not, the thing that tempers people more often than not is empathy, is human connection, is when, when you've got people around you who you care about, who sort of, who rein in your baser instincts and your darker impulses. And she has had none of those things for 300 years. And all this girl does, like she finds, you know, going to the museum interesting because, you know, even after 300 years, there's always something new and, and art is always so wonderful because she can't make her mark, so art is wow. And there's this thread throughout about how she sort of, she can't create anything because of the curse because if she if you leave a mark, then people will remember you. So that's part of like people forgetting her. She can't affect the world really in any permanent way, which again, breaks down very quickly when you go into what she can do. And I'm like, well, why that? Which I'll talk about in a second. But she's been going around her day to day, steals a muffin, steals a new outfit, admires the sunset. Like here and there, we'll, we'll hear reference to the fact that she did live through some world wars. Do we see her experiencing those world wars? No. Again, I, you living through a single war like that, as a normal human, you would be oh, so much more interesting and fucked up because of it. And she's lived through multiple huge wars. She wasn't able to have a human to share it with. So she should be so interestingly messed up. Like she should be Abercrombie level, fascinatingly messed up. And she's not, she's so dull. And the book is written in this style, which grated on my nerves to no end where the, the authorial voice seems to think that this story is deep as hell and that Addie is fascinating as hell. <laughs> it's just like the tone of the author to, to, to write it this way, where the assumption is that you agree that, yeah, that this is deep and that Addie is so great. I was just like, 
the balls of that was reminiscent of Dark Dawn to me by J. Kristoff, which I also hate for many reasons, but that being one of them, this sort of self-referential patting itself on the back in the text. And there's, uh, this is spoilery, so I won't explain how, but not just the authorial attitude, but there is literally like circumstances in the book that are, which is less open to interpret because an authorial voice, you could say, well, that's just your impression of it. And that's, you can't say that was the author's intent with her, like maybe you're projecting that, which, you know, fair, maybe I was because I've heard her talk about this book, but there's events in the book that do this actively, like not in a way that's subjective where it's in the text this sort of nod to how great the book is. And I just found that so nauseating. And again, like I won't say what that is because it's kind of spoilery, but it's there and I fucking hated it. I was like, really? Really, lady? Really? Okay, and so then the curse, the way it works, I guess this is mildly spoilery, so warning. I don't think it is really that spoilery because it's just kind of like the rules for how her curse works. And yes, like you don't know that on page one because you, Addie's figuring it out and you slowly find it out from Addie, but it's not like, None of it is a bombshell in any way. None of it's like, oh, I didn't know the curse worked like that. Like, it's just kind of gradually telling you the rules. So warning, if you want it, like if you want to really not know how the curse works for whatever reason, I'm about to kind of uh, t touch on that. So FYI, as I mentioned before, because people forget her the moment they see her uh, or, the, or the moment they don't see her actually is how I should say that. And she can't leave a mark, meaning she can't, like if she writes something on a piece of paper, the marks just disappear and fade. If she break something, it mends itself. Anything that would sort of permanently affect the space that she's occupied or leave a mark for someone else to find, she can't do it because that would leave something for somebody to remember her by. So that's the kind of, those are the rules for her life. So for that reason, then, you know, she can't journal because she can't leave a mark on a piece of paper. If someone tries to take a picture of her, like her face gets blurred. There can't be any record of her having been somewhere. Although her body is visible, it's her face that's blurred. So like, I guess it's, a, an argument for your face being your identity rather than any other part of your body, which, you know, I guess. What about fingerprints? <laughs> so it doesn't get too in, in detail about that. Like, you know, presumably some of her hair falls out where she goes, which would leave DNA evidence, but like we don't really go into forensics in the book. So we don't go that far into it. I, I don't know how that's supposed to work. So the thing that really, okay, so the two things that really break down for me immediately are the fact that, okay, so if somebody is talking to her, like while they're talking to her, they know who she is and, or, they, they are aware that they're talking to her. She's not like invisible. So like if I walked up to you and was like, hi, how are you doing? I'm Leanna. I'm like, oh, nice to meet you, Leanna. And like, uh, are you looking for something? Like I can have a full conversation with you. And as long as I keep talking to you, as long as you're still like within, I'm still in your line of sight, then you still know that I'm there and you still know you remember what we've been talking about. But as soon as you leave or as soon as you, a door closes, it's, it's a lot to do with doors. So like if we're standing on a doorstep, it's fine. But as soon as that door closes and opens again, you would have forgotten me, which, okay, <laughs> all right. However, we get a lot of montage -y descriptions of the kind of one night stand type connections that she's been able to make that she'll go on basically 50 first dates with the same person because, and so that's kind of how she's dating them because she likes them and she likes spending time with them. And she's kind of relives the same night over and over. And she keeps hearing the same introductory lines, the same pickup lines, because for them, it's the first time. So they go up to her and they're like, you know, hey, like you remind me of someone. She's like, well, that's what you said last night and the night before and the night before and the night before. And then like, they'll they'll hang out together, have a whole day together, sleep together. And then the next morning, if she's bothered to hang around, they wake up and they think that like, they must have gotten drunk and slept with her because they don't remember her, but she's like in their apartment. So that does not work for me because if you've spent the whole day with this person, did they never go pee? Did she go with them to go pee? For, cause this again, like if it's like a two hour date, okay. A two hour date that quickly escalates to sex, okay. But she talks about spending a whole, like whole days with people where they have never once gone to the bathroom <laughs> because it's all it takes is to step into another room is to have a door close and they forget her. So it's just immediately unbelievable to me that that was possible, but apparently it is. I don't know how, but it is. And again, we don't really see those dates. They're more of a montage recollection of like, this is the way she has passed her time. But that's, it doesn't, it, then don't write the curse that way. Make it like a 24 hour thing where like, they'll remember you for 24 hours at a time or something like that. But if it's like the moment the door closes again, pretty sure within, if you haven't gone to the bathroom in 12 hours, <laughs> Yikes, especially because all these dates are like going to coffee shops and restaurants, whatever, like I'm pretty sure you need to pee at the very least pee. So it's just, nope. And then this whole not being able to like uh, break something or leave a mark really also doesn't work for me 
because like I said, if she breaks something, it mends itself because having broken it would leave its mark. But if you steal money, which she does, and use it to buy a muffin and eat that muffin, you're breaking the muffin first by chewing it and then by digesting it. So why is that? Why does that work? I, I don't I don't understand how that could possibly be different because there's a, a, a scene where she it's like a wooden statue or sculpture or something and she like knocks it over or drops it or something and it breaks and then immediately fixes itself like it was never broken like she was never there. But like, this isn't a dress, but like if you just ordered a muffin, then there's one less muffin in the case, which means some person is not gonna be able to have a muffin. That is, you know, if we're talking butterfly effect, that is, that's a, a mark you've left. You have broken the muffin. So, and then she not only eats a muffin herself, but she buys two muffins at one point, has one for herself and then brings the other one to the old man that of course doesn't remember her because she's met him many times, which is why she knows she likes he likes this muffin. But for him, it's the first time eating her because he doesn't remember her. But he's eating the muffin that she brought. That's having an effect. Those are calories he's consuming. I just, I, I don't understand why that's different. I don't. That's just, it's not gone into like a, but you know, food is different because it's just, I guess food is different for some reason. However, she can't light a fire herself which is also like, it, it just doesn't really, like the more it tries to make sense where it's like all these little things you wouldn't have thought of where like, but she can't do that because that'd be leaving a mark. Like, I feel like I'm supposed to be going like, oh wow, those all these little details that I never would have thought of, but those would be leaving a mark. All it's making me think of is all the ways that she is still leaving a mark that really don't fit with this curse. <laughs> so it just frustrated me more than anything. And again, I had no, I wasn't able to forget my frustrations and just sort of get lost in the story of the, these humans because Addie herself is boring as shit for somebody. Like boring as shit just generally, like I don't think she's a very interesting protagonist. And then especially for somebody that's been alive, cursed for 300 years. How are you this boring? How? And then even more to the point, the darkness devil, whatever, that cursed her frequently makes allusion to the fact that out of all of humanity, Addie is the one that really has enticed him, has really, you know, caught his eye that she's the only one that is really that interesting to him because she's not even like other people anymore because she's lived so long. And I'm like, in theory, all of that should be true. In theory, a person like that should stand out and be more interesting, but she's not. So whenever the darkness makes allusion to how fascinating and interesting and desirable and enigmatic she is, I'm just like, it was just reminding me again and again and again about how she absolutely should be and is not those things. So it's not believable to me that the darkness feel this, this way about her. And it's also not believable to me that she is not that way because the darkness should be able to feel that way about her because she should be that way. It was very frustrating. And then like the book kept feeling like in addition to thinking that it was well-written and it being clear from the author's voice that she thinks it's incredibly well-written, the amount of times when the, the book seemed to think it was saying something deep and it wasn't, I, it's just, I mean, it just wasn't like nothing about this book. There's nothing about the concept or the execution that was really one of those like, oh, it really made me stop and think. It really made me consider, really made me reflect on the nature of identity and mortality. I've read plenty of stories that really did make me consider those things. And this was not one of them. <laughs> um, I recently read Alias Grace by Margaret Atwood. And that's a book where it is constantly throwing out even simple one-liners where it made me stop and think and made me uh, reflect on gender and place in society and rank and the nature of the mind and about whether or not who like are, actually weirdly alias grace is a much better job addressing does memory is memory identity and is identity tied to memory because the whole thing with alias grace is that grace is a convicted murderess but she doesn't recall having murdered anyone she kind of blacked out or so she says so if who we are is what we remember is she innocent or is she lying so like it's doing a lot more to make you question those things Addie LaRue would have been fine to be this surface level if it was a short story in a short story the presumption is that we don't have the space and time to really delve into the rules of the curse or into like really who Addie is because that is a page count that we don't have so if this was like a 10 to 20 page short story I feel like I could pack a punch and and the all of the all of it what it was lacking would be more enigmatic because you're like well these are all things that oh, I didn't have time to tell and they're left to the imagination in a 400 page book you had the room to tell it and chose not to so it can you can no longer be like oh well it's just an, an enigma no 
we were with Addie for a long time in this book. And she was really boring. <laughs> was really, really fucking boring. <laughs> Which again is shocking to me. Like if this was a debut author, debut book, um, I would think to myself like, well, I guess this author just like doesn't have the capacity to write really dark characters and to really delve into like a messed up mind to really go there. Except I've read Vicious. Like I know Schwab can do it. I, I, is it because she likes Addie too much that she didn't have it in her to write her to be unlikable and was afraid she'd be unlikable if she wrote her realistically? Because realistically, I don't know that Addie would be likable, but she'd be a hell of a lot more enjoyable to read about if she was more unlikable because it would be fascinating as a character study. Here, she's just, she's so bland. She is so vanilla. <laughs> I just was shocked at how boring she was and how boring the book was and how this is your legacy? This one? All right. So let me know in the comments down below if you have read The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, if you like the majority of, of the reading community is blown away and this knocked your socks off and you just think it's the most amazing book ever and that like Schwab really like nailed it, uh, feel free to let me know because that's, again, based on what I've seen in the reviews, that ought to be the majority of y'all. So do let me know why I'm wrong. But if you agree with me, that's always great to hear as well. So let me know that. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times as well, but definitely Saturdays. So like and subscribe and I'll see you when I see you. Bye.